Hello? Hello there? Is there sound? Nine viewers, nice. Hi. Hi, hi. So, clear audio. Okay, thanks. Good to know. Hopefully, it will be better today. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Now, so just like like last time, I'm gonna start in ten. Well, ten fifteen minutes, obviously. And yeah, I'm gonna try doing the same thing. Any suggestions? Well, I guess I don't have any really like unexpected suggestions. Perhaps, well, like everyone would say, I guess practice is key. So we have 16 viewers. Sure. It's interesting to know how many I will get today. Should be much less than the first time, I guess, but we'll see. So... So everyone who's here, are you here mostly to watch the live, like doing the contest live, or... Do you want to know about uh, the problems afterwards? Do you want to hear the like discussion? What do you think? What do you find interesting? Hmm. Discussion, okay. Both. Okay, let's just wait for some more people to come. And then we'll start at about 21.55, I guess. This time I have a brand new program to mark accepted problems. So this time I have an, a, a different green color and also it's not faint. Should be awesome. See.
Yeah, that's a good question. Did anyone do, do the contest? Don't spoil it though. Yeah, I will try to make all the th all the letters green. That's for sure. Let me go. Yeah, in fact, we got some uh, non-Russian speaking participants last time, and that's pretty cool. But Russian speaking participants are also welcome for sure. Uh, okay, so I will start at 2155, I think, sharp, because everything is ready. also played it okay he also played the first round right so time to learn Russian yes yeah, sure well you did pretty well right I mean, did you? Waste too much time reading the problems? I mean, you had all like <laughs> all problems were correct from the first attempt, so I guess you could just well, you didn't try you read them incorrectly, so maybe it's fine, right? You have to small. Yeah, okay. Google Translate works good. I guess maybe it maybe it's because Russian and Polish are quite similar in structure. Uh, just copying takes some time. I guess I guess I actually found out that <laughs> you could do it like this, right? You could just translate the problems in browser, so it should be pretty good. But uh, well, <laughs> it depends. So, for example, for this problem, the first example test case is 1-1, one, one, and can you guess what I get if I translate if I translate it to English? So, I have 1-1 one, one here, and if I translate it to English, I get 11. You see? Perfectly reasonable. 1 and 1 is 11. So it's not perfect. Okay, so we are starting in 30 seconds, then I will stop reading the chat again. And yeah, I guess. Are you ready? Bad AI. Wow. Thank you. Okay. See you. Thank you. Let's go.
this does not look like a problem. So this problem looked like just do whatever what was written there. Um. This problem looks a bit familiar.
more stuff. Gym, gym. Why is testing so fast? It was like how much? It was more than ten minutes. It's not really good. It's not very really good when you have only 80 minute contest, right? Oh. Also, I guess I didn't win this one, so well played. You started writing a message on Yandex to ask about it. So you mean that you had the same troubles, right? But you did it like you did it today, right? So maybe it's all the same today. Okay. So no, oh, during my stream you started doing it. <laughs> okay. No, I don't drink coffee. I... I drink tea. Maybe I should have some coffee though. At least today. Oh. Uh. Well. So what do you think about blind submissions? Should I use them? Should I actually do better when I make blind submissions? For donations, of course. Maybe it will even improve my performance, right? No, you don't think I need blind submissions, okay. <laughs> Maybe in problem B. Blind submissions are well, so you can see the blue question marks, so blind submissions are... So it's a way to make just one submission, you, you, you are making one submission and you're not allowed to make any extra submissions. And then if the submission is correct, in this one and that, that's, and so on, so you get one point as usual, one problem, but your penalty time is decreased. So the harder the problem, the more is decreased from your penalty. Yeah, if I blind, then he can't win. Okay. Well, why not? Why not let him win, right? Uh, what do I expect on Code Gem 2020? Um, what do you expect on Code Gem 2020? Well, I'll, I'll try to advance to the on-site round first. And then if I do, then I'll try my best at the outside round. That's my expectations. What did you expect? Uh, okay, so I guess I should make a five minute break, maybe less than that, and then we'll go to discuss the problems.
yeah, here it is. Basically, <laughs> I remember about this problem, but I never remember the solution. And so I had to invent it from scratch. But yeah, this is from Pedro Midership Contest. This is, uh, it's not mentioned here, but the source of this problem is Pedro Midership Contest. So basically, uh, I, I don't think, well, it's a bit different because here the points don't have to be uh, to the left bottom, from, like one from each other. They could be form a rectangle in a different direction, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, third place. Okay. That's not too bad. I guess I should be happy about that. And uh, yeah, so blind submission problem B would give me second place. And, uh, and then I don't know. Yeah. Maybe one more blind submission, but then I should be more careful. Anyway. So, yeah. What's the solution to problem B, by the way? How did you guys solve it while you're here? Those who did. So, my solution is uh, something like uh, divide and conquer, yeah, and then. Uh, I had also Fenwick tree, so it's ten log square, similar to mine, I guess. Okay. Okay. I thought that the intended solution was different that year, but no, it was so so much time ago. Okay. So let's see the problems. Okay, so problem A was the easiest problem. In this problem, you are given an array of integers, like this. So this is the number of integers, and then we get five integers in this case. And uh, we need to find an integer k from 1 to n, so that uh, this product is as large as possible. And the integers are small, but that's not important, but they are positive. That's also not important, actually. Um, so, what the solution is, so the easiest solution is just to check every k, and uh, for each k we want to find the value of this exp expression. And uh, if we do it straightforward, in a straightforward way for each k, then it's the complexity of solution is n square. But if we recalculate the sum quickly, moving from one k to the next one, then it will be linear time. So my solution looked like this. So first I try k equal to zero. When k is equal to zero, the first, uh, okay, I guess I can remove this. So the first bracket give us zero because we have no summons there. And the second bracket has just the sum of all integers. So initially I have just s, S is the right part and T is the left part. So initially S is the sum of all integers and T is zero, just empty sum. And then for each I from zero to N, that's actually K in the problem statement terms. I, what I do is I recalculate the sums. So if I move the first term from the right bracket to the left bracket, uh, S will be decreased by AI by the first element first, and the second element, and so on. And t will be increased by the square of that element. And yeah, that's how I recalculate both sums. And then I pick the maximum of s times t as given by the problem. So basically that's the solution, just to do it quickly in linear time. Is it clear? Do you have any questions?
Not yet. Okay. So this was the easiest problem, and yeah, 112 people solved it. Okay. So the next problem was, <laughs> well, I solved problem D. Well, this is not the next easier, easiest problem. Well, okay, so the next solved problem was problem C. Uh, problem C was, uh, well, the problem statement was a bit weird, but uh, we are given a string of letters M and W, and we want to remove some letters from the string. And uh, basically, if we, if you know about correct bracket sequences, then it's pretty clear from the, if you work through the statement that M is, uh, M corresponds to an opening bracket and W corresponds to a closing bracket. So, for example, in the second test case, the second input is M, W, M, W, W, M. And it actually corresponds to open, close, open, close, close, open. And then the question is, we want to remove as few characters as possible so that the string becomes a correct bracket sequence. And that part is easy, basically, when you want to do just that, just remove the, as few number of, like, as small number of brackets as possible, then I just go from left to right and maintain a stack of, uh, well, brackets. They're just of, they're just of one type, so we can just maintain the balance. For each bracket, if it's, uh, if it's opening, then uh, balance is increased by one. If it's closing, then balance is decreased by one. But, but if closing and balance equal to zero, then remove the bracket, remove the closing bracket, because you cannot use it. And then in the end, remove balance opening brackets. Balance is the number of them. Basically, that's easy. That's like the easiest, uh, the easiest solution if we are asked just the number of characters, but we want to find the number of ways to remove that smallest number of characters. Modular, a magic number. So, I actually don't know. So, also, people who solved this problem didn't have a similar solution to mine, because actually I spent a lot of time to come up with it. I don't know. Maybe it was easy, but for me it was not easy somehow. Basically, the solution was, so, so the easiest solution is just do uh, dynamic programming, uh, dynamic programming of uh, uh, position in the string, then, uh, well, okay, basically, so position in the string, then balance again, balance just means the difference between the number of opening and closing brackets, and uh, well, initially I saw that we could have the third parameter is just the number of removed brackets. And it will be the number of ways. So this kind of dynamic programming. And for each character we have just different options. We can remove it or we can use it depending on its type. We go to balance plus one, balance minus one. Or if we remove it, we just increase the number of removed brackets. And uh, this is cubic time, but then we have to know that uh, if we are have the same position and balance, then the number of removed brackets is, uh, it's, well, we don't need to maintain the number of ways for each number of removed brackets because uh, we want to minimize this number eventually. So we just need to uh, maintain like this, the smallest number of removed brackets possible for this position and balance. So my dynamic programming became the DP of post balance to be a pair of number of removed brackets and number of ways. And uh, I want to minimize this pair. And when I like uh, 
compare pairs, I want to minimize the first element first, and then if uh, two pairs have the same number of remove brackets, I add the number of ways in these pairs when I update uh, dp, and uh, basically that's what my solution says. So dp ij is dp post balance in these terms, and it's a pair of integer and modular integer, the number of ways. And yeah, for each character I have three options. One option is just remove the character. Then I go to position plus one, balance kept, keeps unchanged, and uh, the state is number of brackets increased by one, and then the same number of ways. And then if it's an opening bracket, which is character m in the string, in the input, so I go to i plus one, j plus one. Or I go to i plus one, j minus one, It's if, if it's the closing bracket, only if j is positive, and uh, the update function is just uh, if uh, my number of removed brackets is smaller, then I just update the pair. Otherwise, if it's the same, I update, I increase the number of ways. So yeah, I just went through the code. Uh, if you have any questions, do ask. And uh, what is harder to me? Code forces division one problems or IOI problems? So I guess you can figure it out yourself. So in code force division one, you have, well, five and sometimes six, sometimes seven lately problems for two hours. And at IOI, you have three problems for five hours. And even though not everyone competes in IOI, the top participants are very strong. And I suppose that obviously IOI should be much harder on average at least. Well, the easiest IOI problem could appear on <laughs> code for In fact, uh, the one of the problem one of the problems from IOI last year was <laughs> featured at code forces with smaller constraints as you could know. So I guess it just just proves that we can have code force IOI problems at code force. So this is problem C. Uh, the next problem was problem F. Problem F was uh, about, well, integers. Uh, oh, prime numbers. That's actually cool. I didn't expect the translation will be correct. Cool. So we have n integers. Uh, we have two buttons under each like cell integer, and uh, one button increases the number by one, and the, the other one decreases the number by one, and we want to have prime integers in all like the cells of the array. And you have to make exactly m button presses, and the question is whether we can do that, and if we can do that, then uh, how many times we have to press each button under each cell? Uh, yeah, here it is, 11. I found it. <laughs> Why is 1 space 1 11? But then 1 space 0 is 10 as an integer, and 1 space 2 is 12 as an integer. And 1 space 1 is 11. I just wonder. Well, okay. So, what's the solution? If... Uh, we had uh, to make at most, how about 2, 2? Is it 22? I don't know. There is no 2, 2 here, so I can't check. Probably not. I wouldn't expect that. So if we just had to make at most M button presses, not exactly M button presses, but at most M, then the problem would be much, well, easier in some sense, because it would have no like corner cases almost because you just would take each integer and just move it to the closest prime. So we just check the closest prime above this integer, closest prime below this integer, and just uh, push the increase or decrease button, depending on which one is closer, the required number of times. And you want the, yeah, and then you just check if the total number of presses is at most m. And basically, in my solution, 
this is just uh, sieve for finding primes and then here for each in I input the integers and then for each integer I find x and y x is the closest integer below ai well not always because sometimes the integer is 0 or 1 then the number is the number is well, 2 the smallest prime is 2 and then y is the integer the prime above ai and sum is just the number of presses the total number of presses is the minimum of l and r l is this number of presses to get x and r is the number of presses to get y so if uh, we had to make at most m presses the problem would be solved by this that by this point we just have sum we compare it to m if it's more than m then the answer is obviously no in, in both cases in any case but if it's less than m then uh, it's not always easy to make exactly m presses so an important observation like in this observation is that uh, if uh, we push an increase button on one cell and increase and the decrease button on the same cell if we have two pushes then uh, like this then we don't change anything right so basically if we can make exactly sum uh, button presses then we can also make sum plus two button presses we can just spend two presses on increasing and increasing the same number so basically what we know then is is that if sum and m have the same parity the same remainder of division by 2 then uh, the problem is still solved we just use extra presses we just use ex extra m minus sum presses if m minus sum is even then uh, easy just uh, just press increase decrease m minus sum divided by two times but if the parity is incorrect then uh, we have to change it and we cannot just uh, push increase decrease easily we will have one more leftover operation which will spoil something but basically what we when we want to change parity it just means that we have to find the closest prime to each integer which is of different parity so for each integer ai we find the closest prime first that's what we have already found and then now we want to find the closest prime which has a different parity and uh, for one of these integers and actually for exactly one of those integers we will go not to the closest prime but to the closest prime of different parity that's it and uh, we want to pick the integer so that the difference between the number of steps before and after is as small as possible so we want to uh, like we in because we will go not to the closest prime but to the closest prime of different parity we will spend more steps than uh, we actually had to spend but we want this extra number of steps to be as small as possible so what we do is for each integer we want to find the smallest number of extra steps and then we take the minimum of extra steps and at will be the position of integer which will be which will go to the different parity so how do we find the extra basically the thing to note here is that parities of primes are not very interesting because there is an only even prime which is 2 and all the other primes are odd so if the closest prime to now our integer is 2 then we actually just have to go to 3 because uh, the, if we go if going to 2 is the closest way then going to 3 is the like, next closest way and 3 has a different parity from 2 but if the closest prime is not 2 then both closest primes on both the left side and the right side are odd 
so we will have to go to 2, to the only even prime. So the new number of steps we will have to make is ai minus 2. And the old number of steps is still min minimum of li and ri, as I said before. And this is the extra number of steps, and we take the minimum of this. And basically that's it. After that, I just carefully output the answer. That's about problem F. So it's a bit tricky, but basically it's just case analysis. Do you have questions about problem F? And... Well, well. Why is my name tourist? That's a good question. That's that's a good challenge for you. Try to find the answer. I guess I answered this one a number of times. So problem D. Uh, well, I feel like I solved problem D before. I, I'm not sure where, but it feels like maybe at code forces. Do you know the source of problem D, like any source? Because just I, I, I just feel like I, I saw the same problem. It was not far, not a long time ago. And I feel like it was code forces. Do you have any idea? Should I try to find? Probably no. It just feels so, I don't know, familiar. Well, whatever. I guess it doesn't matter. Maybe because I have wars in every country. Because there were competitions and you are tourists. Maybe. Mm. So I also saw a question. The usual day of tourist is sightseeing, I suppose. So. Uh, okay, so this problem is a bit... tricky to explain, but I'll try anyway. So, in this problem we have a graph. Basically we have n intersections and m two-way roads. That's usually what we have for graphs and the roads are two-way but what we have to do is to find a path in this graph we have a value of each vertex of each intersection it's vi it's positive for each vertex and you want to find the path in this graph which will which has the largest sum of values of vertices on this path. And we have a restriction on this path. The path doesn't have to be simple. We can visit the vertex several times, but its cost is only counted once, once we visit it. And uh, for each edge, we can only use the edge in only one direction. From left to right, like or from right to left, from the first, second vertex, or vice versa. And we cannot use the edge in both ways. And the question is, like, what is the best cost of a pass we can have? So the solution is, uh, basically, the, the question is, what can we do? What kind of pass can we build? So. Code forces five eight six problem E. Oh, let's see. Could be. I feel it was. Yeah, it looks looks actually actually looks correct. I wonder why you 
why your handle is CF586, but anyway, up to you. Uh, okay. Hmm. Okay, maybe that's the problem I was thinking about. I guess the solution is a bit different then. Yeah, I guess it's a bit different, but yeah, probably it's the problem I was thinking about. Yeah, thank you. At least I know now. Also, I like the name. The name is perfect, right? Perfect name. Well, not so perfect. Maybe one letter could be different. So, okay, whatever. So the question is what kind of paths we can have And uh, here we need the concept of be connected components. Uh, be connected components. And also, well, strongly connected components, I suppose. So we have B components in undirected graphs. And we have strongly connected components in directed graphs. So if you don't know what that is, then uh, you like uh, look it up, at least after the stream. And here is one, I don't know, lemma maybe. It is that if we have a uh, we can direct edges in a be connected component to make it a strongly connected component. Basically, that's it. So you have, if you have a be connected component in a direct graph, then we can direct it edges so that the edges become like strongly connected. So, for example. I don't know if we have like it's hard anyway. So if we have something like this, so we have like four edges in this graph, for example, maybe maybe five. So this uh, be connected component, okay? So we can direct edges, for example, like this. We direct the first edge like this, the second edge like this, the third edge like this and the fourth edge like this, and then this edge, whatever. And here we get a strongly connected component. So that's one way in this case. And in general, we can prove that this is possible for every be connected component. Uh, hey, Dillinger, yeah, this is my second stream. And Bitwise, uh, the videos have been delete deleted. That's that's sad. I'm not sure. I thought that they were there. Maybe they're just hidden, but that's weird. Anyway, thank you, thank you. So, con components refer to edges. No, components. Component is a subgraph. Yeah. So a B connect component is in general is a component. Uh, so such that we have at least two paths between every two vertices and con strongly connected component is a component where we have a pass between every pair of vertices in both directions. So that's kind of similar concepts. And gen then in general, we can have several be connected components in a graph. For example, it could be like this and then like this. So here we have uh, three be connected components. For example, one be connected component is the one I already drew. The second one is just one vertex, and the third one is this one. And also, it's well known that uh, we have, if we just compress the be connected components, we just find them and uh, see what which pairs of be connected components are connected with edges. Then, these components. Form a tree. 
so the solution becomes just uh, finding the B-connected components, compressing them. After we compress them, we have a tree. The weight of each compressed vertex is the sum of weights of all individual vertices in this component. And after that, we want to find the path in the tree, which is like the longest one. Not the longest one, but the path with the maximum total sum of weights. Because we can al always, always direct the edges like this. So for example, if you find a path which contains the first component, then the second component, the third component, we just direct the edges uh, in uh, the way I told you to make them strong, strongly connected. And then for each edge, on the pass, I direct it like in the direction of the pass. So for example, if I direct the edges like this in this case, then I can just go through the first component in any way I want. I can go from any vertex to any other vertex. Then I go to the next one, I go to the third one, and then again I can visit all the vertices and go to any vertex. Uh, so basically something like that. That's the solution. And then finding the longest the longest pass in a tree is kind of standard problem. It can be done in the same way as you find the diameter of the tree. If you just find the farthest vertex from each vertex in the our distance metric, and then you find the farthest vertex, vertex from that first vertex, and that's your pass. Or you could have some DP, for example, on a tree. That's up to you. So that's it. Can I share how one can solve forbidden subgraph from IOI? Uh, I don't remember. So isn't isn't it a problem with open test data? I think it is. I guess this solution is just it, it just depends on uh, depends on the test data. I think. So I think the solution should be different for different test, test cases and maybe handcrafted for, like it had a small subgraph on each graph, right? I don't remember the statement completely, but yeah. I guess that it's kind of grinding, grinding problem. So you just look at every possible structure which you have in the test cases and then just, just use them. Just use the structure to solve the test case. So, okay, so we have two problems left. Whew. So, problem E. In problem E, we had, well, I guess, so basically we had a, a tree with n vertices, but n was quite large, 100 million. But it had a special structure. Each vertex n had uh, a vertex n divided by two as the, its parent, and the uh, vertex each vertex n had like the value which was equal to n. And then uh, we had some queries. One type of query was change the time, like the value of the vertex, to some different value. Here it is. <laughs> Sorry, I, ju I, I just wonder. I just wonder. I think it's kind of funny. So, and the second type of query is uh, just a vertex, and uh, we need to find the longest pass. And again, longest means the largest sum of weights of times on the path, which passes through vertex R. So, for this tree, this tree is special. The structure of this tree is that uh, the height of this tree is uh, logarithmic because like it's just a full, well, kind of full, Complete, maybe? Yeah, it's somewhat complete, but not really. The last uh, layer is not complete binary tree. And uh, 
how do you find the longest pass that passes through some vertex? There are several cases. So one case is uh, one case is that if we have a vertex, the pass could just go. Well, each vertex has at most two children. So one way is that the pass could just go somewhere from one child and one somewhere from the other child. So like. That could be our path, which just goes like this. And uh, also our vertex has some parents, right? And these parents have their own children. And then the path could go uh, somewhere in the subtree of this vertex, then go up uh, until some point and then go down, down somewhere. So we have like this way or this way. And uh, given that the height of the tree is not large, it's just logarithm of n, we can just try all possible options. So the first option is the blue path, it's easy. And then the green path is we just have to check every possible, like, highest vertex in the path. And we, this highest vertex in the path has to be the parent of our given vertex r. And uh, this is vertex r. And uh, we have at most logarithm parents, so we can check them all. And then that's the idea, and then the, the solution well becomes to just carefully calculate what is given, uh, like calculate what is needed. I don't know, maybe someone who is still alive in the chat has a simpler solution, but I guess that most people who solve the problems or who can solve the problems have already left. So maybe not many people will help me from here. But anyway, my, my approach was to just, well, maintain two maps. So one map is just t. t is just the time we need in vertex, like map from vertex to time we need in this vertex. So it's just the value of this vertex given in the statement. Initially, it's i for each vertex i, but we do not initialize it because we have too many vertices. Instead, we just have an empty map, and uh, if this vertex belongs to the map, then uh, we just know that the time is like that value in the map, and if this vertex is not in the map, then it's just its index. So that's get time, and the other map is get down, and down is the map. And down is the value of the pass. Like the largest possible sum of weights through a pass down from vertex V. And again, get down is the function that calculates it. If uh, it was already calculated and stored in the map, then we just return it. Or otherwise, if it's just some vertex in the tree which for which we haven't found the high, the ver the path down, then uh, we have to find it. And here we have two cases. Basically, if we remember that uh, the tree is complete but not really complete, so it's, it looks something like this, in fact. So, and also the indices of vertices increase from left to right, so they just increase in this direction, right? And so here we have some vertices, and here we have vertices only on some prefix of the layer. So we can note that the biggest pass, if this subtree is kept untouched, that is for each vertex, the waiting time is equal to the index of a vertex, then the biggest pass is one of two paths. So one way is if we just go to the right, always to the right, that's one way we can get the largest path. And another way is take the last vertex and go up from there. And that's our like second pass. So basically, we just have to compare two paths. One path is going straight to right, and the other one is going from the last vertex, from vertex n. 
and we can just see that all any other paths are dominated by this path, one of these two paths. Any path that goes from to the left of vertex n will just be worse on every layer. It will just use a vertex to the left. And similar to the, this vertex, if we start from here, we just could just start from the rightmost vertex and it would be better. Instead of two cases, you can notice that you, you should go down to the left child only if it's maximum pass down is longer than the right ones. Uh, okay. But how do I find the longest pass in the left child or the right child? I mean, that's the case when I don't have anything stored. So if I want to find the longest pass in the left, how, how do I find it without just checking all possible leaves? I, I, I'm not sure I get it. Can you explain? But anyway, to continue with my approach, so I have two cases. This is the first case, just go right. And this is the second case, just go from vertex n up. And if we get to vertex v at some point, then it's fine. If we don't, then it's, uh, well, minus one. It means that we don't have this path. It's the number of digits in n divided by v. Uh, okay, you mean the maximum pass not by the weight, but by the length, by the number of vertices in the pass. Okay, so you just mean that, uh, so you just kind of mean that if we can go from vertex n up, then it's always better. I guess it should be obvious here. Yeah. Okay, I see, I see. Because if we go from vertex n to its parent, its parent is n over 2, its parent is n over 4, and so on, right? And uh, if we start from some vertex r, it's r, r over 2, r over 4, and so on. And so this path should be definitely worse than this one, right? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's reasonable. So I guess we just have to start from n if we can, or if we cannot, then we just have to go to the right. Okay, that could make it a bit easier, but anyway, that's the get down function again. And recalc function is uh, the pass down from vertex is the time from this vertex plus the maximum of get down of its children. That's kind of reasonable, just the standard DP thing. So that's just the preparation functions. And then it's not hard now to solve the problem. When we have the query of the first type, we change the vertex. We just uh, change its value in the map, and then we recalculate the path down from this vertex, and we also recalculate the best path down from each of each its parents. We just go up and recalculate everything, because only the paths down from parents have changed at this point, if we change the value of one vertex. And when we want to find the longest path through one vertex v, we have, like I said, two options. So one option, one option is the blue pass, and the blue pass is calculated here. We have uh, get time of vertex v. That's where I had the bug, by the way. I, I had just v, and I should have had just get time of v. That's not very clever. I should have been more careful, but that's fine. So get down of the right of the left child of v, and get down of the right child of v, and I just sum up these three values. And uh, to account for green pass, I iterate over parents of V. I go to its parent first, then its grandparent, and so on. U is the index of the well browser of vertex V, of the current one. So it's, uh, well, I'm using XOR here. Because this way, if V is equal to 2P, then U is equal to 2P plus 1. And if V is equal to 2P plus, P plus 1, then U is equal to 2P. So that's what I do. And then I get the time of this parent, like the time of this green vertex, of this highest vertex in the green path. Then other is the length of the path down, which uses the initial vertex. And get down of U is the right, like the, the other side of the path which doesn't use the initial vertex. And they attack the maximum. That's kind of it. 
So, can the graph problem be solved with Dijkstra? I don't think so, because... Well, first of all, you have to find the longest path, kind of longest path. The longest path is... Uh, well, the problem is how do you formulate the problem, because... I mean, you can use Dijkstra to find the longest path in the tree, but again, to do that... Mm, so, for example, if you have a tree, you want to find the longest path in a tree, like the diameter of the tree, you can do it with uh, dp in linear time, or you can do it with two searches in linear time as well. You could use the extra instead of searches, but you don't need it, because on a tree, any like depth first search or breadth first search is enough. But uh, you still need to use some kind of like an idea that you have to start just twice because in general if you find if you try to go from every vertex and run the extra from every vertex then it will be n square log n time or n square so at least so that's not good enough if n is large so in general i just suggest to look up about uh, searching diameters in trees and that could be helpful in this case uh, segment tree. No, there is no segment tree here, but it's, yeah, basically the children of problem v, of vertex v are 2v and 2v plus 1, so it's kind of similar to segment tree, but it's just the, the property of uh, like complete binary tree in general. It's just useful, it's just handy to use this kind of vertices for segment trees as well. Uh, I have never been to IMO. I could have a chance to go there, but that's kind of a different story. And yeah, I guess I won't go for it right now, but I can surely tell it some time later. So, problem B is the last one. And problem B is from Pyotr Midrashev contest, uh, what was the number? I don't know. So it's available at HCMSGU, SGU, are you? It, uh, yeah, I remember solving this problem at that website. So we basically need to find the number of pairs of points. Uh, uh, we, so that they form a rectangle so that they are the lower left and the upper right corners of rectangle and there are no other points on the sides or inside that rectangle and the question is how many pairs we can take if uh, 11 11 if n is small then we can have something called writing but here we need something faster i guess because we have 100 thousand points and two seconds so the solution is, it's not simple, but I'll try to explain it roughly. So, suppose we have some points here. Uh, the solution will be divided based on divide and conquer. What is that 11 in every input and output? 11 is uh, 1, 1. So basically, if I open the Russian ver version of the problem, then you have two integers separated by a space, 1 and 1. And for some reason, when I translate this statement into English automatically, then it's trans translated as 11. Uh, yeah. So the solution will be based on divide and conquer. So we want to find the number of pairs of points. What we will do is divide the points in half by a vertical line. Now we'll try to find the number of pairs of points so that one point is from the left part and the other one is from the right part. And they form a good rectangle. For example, this is a good rectangle. And uh, then we just solve the problem for the left part and the right part independently. And just sum up all the answers. And if we have uh, if we find the number of pairs of points in n log n time, for example, that's what I did, then we have n log square for the overall complexity. So if we do, so we have divide and conquer, 
if we do, if we do well conquer in all of n log n time then overall we have all of n log square n so the question is well n is the number of points here right in in the part we are given so the question is how do we go quickly how do we find the number of pairs of points in different parts quickly and uh, my idea is the following so consider some rectangle so suppose we have a rectangle and suppose it's a good rectangle which satisfies our conditions for it to be a good rectangle we need to have no points inside it right so what could be the bad points so the bad points could be something like something like this the bad coin points could uh, belong to the left part or to the right part and we don't want these points, but if you have points somewhere in different places, then it's fine for us. They don't spoil anything for us. So suppose we don't have any, any red points. We only have green points. What is the condition that we don't have any points inside the rectangle? We don't have any points inside the rectangle when we don't have any points in its left part and any points in its right part. And by left and right part, I just mean uh, like the point to the left of the line. Sorry. Point to the left of the line. That's one part and the other part is like the right part. Right, so we don't want to have any points here and here. What I will do is for each point, for each black point on the left part, I will find the closest point, which is higher and which is like to the top and top right from this black point. So for example, in this case, we'll find this point, this green point. So we just find the closest one, which is to the right and higher than our point and belongs to the left part still. I just find this point. And similarly, on the right part for each point, I find the closest point to the left of it, which is lower than it but still in the right part. So, for example, I will find this point in this case. What will happen then is I have a... For each point on the left part, I have two integers. Basically, I am only interested in two integers. The y-coordinate of the, this point, this is y1, let's say, and the y coordinate, this is y axis. I guess I should go for some graphical table at some point. But for now, it could be fine, I guess. Maybe my paint skills will develop over time and then I will just don't need any, I will just not need any tablets. I will just, I will just use paint and it will be faster than Right in it. So I want. I, I'm only interested for for the point on the left part. I'm only interested in uh, the y coordinate of one of the point and the y coordinate of the closest point to the top right. And for the points on the right part, I want to know like again the y coordinate of the closest point of the bottom left and the y coordinate of this point. Okay. So we have one y one. For example, in this case, we have one y, y1, y2, y3, and y4. And now, uh, the condition is as follows. A pair of points is, well, friendly. If uh, first we need y4 less than y2. 
because if, if one y2 is less than y4, for example, if the point is somewhere here, then it's bad for us. But we want, don't want that to happen, so we need y4 less than y2. And similarly, we want y3 to be less than y1, because if we have a point somewhere here, then it's bad for us, but otherwise it's good. So this is just the conditions that we don't have any points inside the rectangle. Okay, so if these two conditions are satisfied, remember that y2 is the closest point to the top, right? And in, in the top sense, like in the vertical sense. And y3 is the closest point to the bottom left, and again closest in the bottom sense. Then if these two conditions are satisfied, then we don't have any points inside the rectangle. And uh, if they are not, then we have a point. And also we need the following condition, we need y2 to be less than y4 actually, because this should be the lower left and the upper right corners. So if we just disregard this condition, just forget about for a while, forget about the last one, then what we actually have is uh, we have some points of the first type on the left part, y1, y2, and we have some points. And these are like points on some different plane, but we just have like two types. So here we have y3, y4, and we want to count the number of pairs so that y3 is less than y1 and y4 is less than y2. That's what we need. And this part of the problem is easily solvable in like using a usual sweep line. So we just sort all the problems on the all, all the points on the first coordinate. And then uh, we maintain some kind of segment tree. Uh, so we use sweep, sweeping line. We maintain some kind of segment tree or Fenwick tree to count points in some range. And uh, uh, we sort all points in increasing order of coordinate one. And then for each point in this order, if uh, it's of the first type, then we make modify tree in coordinate like point coordinate two uh, do plus one. Uh, otherwise, we add uh, the sum in the tree from well zero to coordinate two. So that's like in order of coordinate one. We just do something like this. So that's kind of the basic sweeping line. Is sweeping line two pointers? N not really. So two pointers is uh, something like you... Two pointers usually give you a linear time thing. So two pointers is a technique when you have well, two pointers. <laughs> Here you have just one. Basically, you just iterate over points from left to right. And uh, you have, instead of the second pointer, you have uh, some kind of data structure in this case. And usually you do have a data structure and sweeping line algorithms. And you make some queries for each event. In this case, an event is the point we encounter. Is it similar to finding two closest 2D points? Well, it's similar in the sense that we do divide and conquer, but it's not similar in the sense that what we do inside is kind of different. In the usual to find two closest points, we do some kind of sorting and just two pointers, right? And that's n log, n -log n total overall. And here we have n log square because we use some kind of data structure. But it's similar in the case, like in the sense that we use divided conquer and it's kind of, si kind of similar. We just divide the points into parts and something like that. 
and uh, yeah actually if we remember about this condition we just have to subtract number of inversions like uh, in the initial permutations I guess I won't go into details about here if you understand until this point then I guess you can figure out what you do if you want to subtract pairs where y1, y1 is more than y4 because if this is the case then we always count these pairs of points so basically we can know that for any pair of points so that one point is to the top left of the other one we have counted it for sure and then uh, we just subtract all these pairs and then we again need some kind of fenwick tree probably that's what we do I guess that's it for the problems. Uh, the problems were, I don't know, the problems were kind of standard, I guess. Especially given that some of the problems, one of the problems was from Piotr Midashev contest, but well, who knew? Who knew that, right? And uh, well, problem C is nice, I think. A is easy, but it's also not bad. B is, yeah, I explained it, so it's kind of known, but the solution is nice, I think. It's quite technical, but if you realize how to solve such problems, then it should be pretty good for you. So problem C is nice DP. Problem D is more technical than interesting, I guess. Problem E is something like well be careful I guess it's not super fun and F is also about corner cases and being careful so that's it uh, can I describe echo 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 I guess classic algorithm please ah uh, well I'm not sure I'm much into explaining algorithms, so I mean, I guess I might do that at some point, but I think that the issue it definitely should not be done on stream. I guess that explaining algorithms should be done like using videos. I don't think that like I, it should be some kind of videos that should be prepared carefully in advance. So it's kind of different, different type of content to what I'm doing right now. So I cannot promise for sure, but maybe if I feel like doing some educational video content, then I could consider that algorithm for sure. Um, can I stream more? So yeah, I think that I will be streaming the next three rounds at least, so you can find the schedule of streams uh, at the bottom of Twitch channel. So we'll have round three, round four, and round five of winter series. And also we can see what what is like we cannot see the current standings, but I guess I should be in the lead after two rounds. But it's still close, so Stonefang. Are, is doing well, Ildar is obviously doing well as well. So it should be a tough battle. We'll try to see. Is it possible you solve English statements? Well, given, it's, given that it's not hard to translate the problems, like just one, just two clicks, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm a bit afraid that when I just use automatic translation, then the problems could be just translated incorrectly and then I just solve a different problem to what it is. So it just depends about, like depends on what contest I do. And the one I do right now and the one I'm going to do for the next three streams is in Russian, so that's what we'll stick for with Russian for now, but I'll keep explaining the problem in English, I think. 
a nice t-shirt, thank you. By the way, Google hash code is around the corner. It's gonna happen. Like the elimination round is in a month, I think. So be sure to uh, sign up. That's a very nice competition, I think. Well, okay. I guess I have to wrap it up. I am not sure. <laughs> well, what exactly is the question? Is hash code C++ competition? Totally not. Hash code is a competition where you have just one problem and you can use well any tools you want. You can just solve the like the test. You are just giving the test cases, and you are expected to give outputs. So you can just do them do them by hand if you want. But they are just too huge. But you can use any technology. That's what makes the competition pretty nice. I think. Uh, okay. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And the next stream is. The next stream is in five days. It should happen in five days. Be sure to follow. <laughs> follow with. Yeah. Be sure to follow. Bring your friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day. <laughs>